Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. An important aspect of the art world that I have to say I don't think we've ever covered on the podcast is art books. Art books and catalogs serve an important role. They chronicle exhibitions, they're educational, and they're beautiful. There's also a really interesting market for first edition art books and catalogs that has transformed over the past several years due to a variety of reasons. So in this week's episode of the podcast, we wanted to dig into this area of the art world further as we're joined by Lee Kaplan, founder and co-owner, along with his wife Whitney, of Arcana Books on the Arts. They specialize in new, rare, and out-of-print books, catalogs, and ephemera on 20th and 21st century art. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, Adam, thank you so much for wanting to make our shop a part of the Art Tactic podcast. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. So to start things off, for our listeners who aren't familiar with Arcana Books on the Arts, tell us about the origins of the shop and what exactly you do. Well, these days we're an open shop in Culver City, California, which is an incorporated city in Los Angeles. Um, we specialize, as you said, in books, exhibition catalogs, and ephemera on 20th century art, architecture, photography, also design, fashion, visually oriented books on cinema and music and a few other things. But we started in 1984 in a one-bedroom apartment in West Los Angeles, not in the apartment that I lived in, mind you, but a little tiny place. And it was devoted to books and catalogs on art. I started off selling out of print things that you couldn't get elsewhere. And that all kind of developed out of my having worked for five years at what was one of Los Angeles' most beloved record shops, Rhino Records, which is also in Westwood Boulevard. And having worked there for five years, it was time to move on and figure out what I wanted to do for myself. And I thought the best thing I could do would be to transfer my knowledge of how to be in the retail world of vinyl and use the knowledge that I gained and transfer that into the world of selling books, books on art. And so you established Arcana in 1984. During that time, who were your primary customers and how were books and catalogs typically used back then in this pre-digital era? Well, those are great questions, and I'm going to expound a little bit because it was such a different time, especially for younger people, professionals, and collectors in the art market. It would be hard to fathom how different it was in terms of the exchange of information, which is integral to you know, buying and selling works of art and knowing how the market is flowing and what's going on and who's doing what. So anyway... Uh, when I began, the Impressionist, Modern, and Contemporary art markets were on a huge upswing that would ultimately reach that tulip-like moment, sale of you know Van Gogh's irises, first to Alan Bond, and then later when he defaulted on his payments to the Getty uh, for the then unheard of price of $53.9 million. That happened, and then in 1990, the whole modern contemporary art market crashed based on the crash of the Tokyo real estate market, which is a whole other fantastic story, but not one we're going to get into too much today. But in the rise to that, there was really a frenzied demand on the part of collectors, gallerists, and auction houses to compile comprehensive reference libraries to take advantage of works as they came up on the secondary market. You have to understand that back then, um, there wasn't there weren't cell phones, there weren't cameras on your cell phone, there wasn't text messaging, there wasn't emailing even. Faxes were barely you know, coming into existence as technology. And so what happened, it's like now, you know, you you think of the art, the contemporary art fair as people going, what you know, whipping out their camera phone, sending an image to their spouse or their art advisor and saying, hey, should we get this? You know, what do you think? Back then, it was such a complicated process. You had to, if you if there was a secondary market work for sale came into your gallery, you had to hire a professional photographer to photograph it, 
develop it, make a transparency. If you wanted to offer it to somebody not in the same city with you, you basically had to, fe- you had to go through that and then FedEx it. And it was a complicated process that took maybe a week. And the market was so hot in that period that if you had a Gerhard Richter that you just bought and you wanted to sell, if you were another dealer trying to find that work, you waited a week to figure it out, work was gone. That's how frenzied things were. So all of these people in the art world were getting really serious about putting together comprehensive libraries where, you know, that Richter painting or that Mangold painting or that Ryman painting might be in a catalog or, and you know, or might be in an exhibition catalog or a monograph so that you knew what the work looked like and you had something to go on. Maybe there was provenance there, maybe there wasn't, but people functioned off of their libraries. All the best dealers had all the best libraries and not unlike the art market where people are always wanting to pay top dollar to get something really rare that really is the center point of their collection. There were things like the Monet and Manet and Gauguin, catalogs Raisonne, Van Gogh, that would sell for thousands of dollars. Some were four figures. There were certain things that sold for five figures. The Picasso catalog Raisonne, which was in 33 volumes, which is always, a, you know, it's kind of like the grail for most people back then to have a complete set of Zervos, uh, who was the author of it. It could go for somewhere between forty and sixty thousand dollars just for the books. But if a Picasso came up on the market and you were either buying or selling, you the difference between you were having that set of books and not maybe made the difference of acquiring it or selling it or not. So all of that was very important. So it's a really heady time when information was kind of key and not everybody had access to it. So that's the market in which I opened my store, and those were our clients, and business was booming. Yeah, it's really amazing to hear just how integral in that pre-digital time period, especially books and catalogs were to the art market and helping facilitate transactions. And so today with the digitization of books and everything really in society, so many things have changed. How are people today predominantly using art books and catalogs? I've been doing this okay now for almost 40 years. And traditionally the book trade, both new and used, has been viewed as this kind of genteel, you know, it's, it's, a gen, it's, it's a genteel world. And not really much had changed from probably the beginning of the 20th century until the advent of Amazon, which we can talk about later. But there was, there's always been a marketplace for people with taste and means to acquire books. And just as one would collect art to do all the things that art does, you know, conf- for joy, confer happiness, confer cultural legitimacy, confer the, you know, veneer of wealth or, you know, the aura of true wealth. Books have gone along with that. So it, you know, for the learned gentleman or gentlewoman, having a significant library was always a mark of class and culture. So art books have gone along with that. But starting with the generation of younger people, who grew up learning to take their information from a screen, their phone, their pad, their laptop, as opposed to primarily taking it from books, which everybody did up till a certain point because screens with information didn't exist. It's a very different thing. Um, You or I probably had either our parents or our grandparents, you know, sit us on their knee and hold a book and read to us. And there's a whole kind of tactile thing that goes along with that, you know, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a feel good experience. The notion of like what, you know, what your first book was like or holding a book or being told about, you know, the significance of what's contained between the covers for a younger generation that's coming along now, who are the people who are kind of consumers on the big level of art media. It doesn't, books don't have in my experience, the same kind of feeling. There are certain things that seem like, oh, this is a really cool, this is a super rare book on Jean-Michel Basquiat, or here's one of Ed Ruscha's Every Building on the Sunset Strip. You know, they're like objects that are kind of touchstones for the modern art history or the modern art market. But putting together a reference library in the same way doesn't seem to have quite the same significance because unlike a period of time where 
only the books existed to hold that information. Now you can put whatever you need in a search engine, get visual reference, get textual reference virtually instantaneously. You can read for hours. It costs you nothing. You don't generally have to spend anything and you don't have a physical object to store. So it's very, very, very different. And so we've seen the art market booming for the last several years. We just had some major auctions in New York that did very well. How would you describe the health of the first edition art book market at the moment? Is it on a similar trajectory as the art market? Are there certain interesting trends developing that you're seeing? Well, this, this kind of touches on almost everything that we've talked about until now. So the generation, this is a story I'm fond of telling. So the generation of collectors and just, you know, clients, I mean, a large part of who we sell books to are artists and photographers. And a lot of them are younger too. You know, people who are just starting out to mid-career artists. It's not all just, you know, wealthy individuals who buy books from us. In fact, far from it. But, you know, the people who have traditionally supported our bookstore have, you know, they're, if they're not my age or slightly older, I'm 66, but, you know, they're reaching an age where, if they bought books to foster their knowledge about collecting, they're not collecting in the same way. Maybe they're selling off their collections. You know, hopefully they haven't shuffled off from this mortal coil, but, you know, there are people who are downsizing, empty nesting, uh, retiring, and, you know, they've put together bookshelves and bookcases and rooms full of books. And so now are no longer buying like they used to, but in fact, want to sell their books back to Arcana or places like Arcana. So the consumption for some of these great books, it's not the same way that it was, it's that it's been since, you know, we opened the shop. And so the younger generation coming along, as I discussed, who are not so fixed on having the book as a reference, you know, some may want them as objects, and that's a whole other story. And that's a large part of, you know, the rare art book business, but we're coming along where the generation that traditionally bought and collected from us is not buying in the same way. And the generation that has come along of people, especially, you know, a lot of younger artists who are now, now find themselves with disposable income in many instances where they would like to, you know, buy things, buy a home, whatever. They don't feel the need to buy books in quite the same profusion or quantity that their you know earlier predecessors typically did, so it's a weird moment. There are always touchstone books that people are going to want to own. You know, everybody who can get their hands on a beautiful copy of Hugo Mulas's New York New Art Scene would probably want to own it. The significance of owning a copy of Twenty Six Gasoline Stations, Ed Ruscha's first artist book. Things like that never go away. You know, the great Jean-Michel Basquiat books, the great Warhol books. The, you know, there's a demand still there, but it's not the same as when, you know, people were traditionally all kind of buying for the same books. So when people come to me, there's a thought in amongst many people who are involved in the art market and collectors. It's like, well, okay, if I buy this, will it hold its value? Will it escalate in value? You know, how long before I would have to own this book? Would I be able to double my money? And I really try to disabuse um, people coming to us and discussing these things for the first time of that notion. It's like books are things, you know, they can be many things, but I always really suggest that people buy books because they love them and, or they enjoy them if they don't love them. But I, I really feel that people should buy from that perspective and not look at it like some transactional thing. It's like, okay, you know, if I buy the Sigmar Polka book and it's got this original signed print in it, if I'm paying $2,000, you know, do I get my $2,000 back plus another 2000 in 2028? You know, I, there are people who want to do that. And that's part of collecting, but I don't think you can extrapolate what goes on in the marketplace for real, unique, individual artworks to books. You know, most books are mass produced. Most art books, while they're not large production runs in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, most art books, there's at least 500 to 1500 copies produced. 
And, you know, one of the things that people ask me a lot is like, okay, this catalog, is it a first edition? Well, probably 95 to 98% of all the art books that are ever published only have one printing. So pretty much everything's a first edition. But um, yeah, it's not, it's not quite the same thing. It's just like you should buy them because it gives you a sense of something or maybe you just enjoy it as an object. And then, of course, there's the whole notion of the way that books have become interior design accessories, which is actually a part of what we do. But, you know, it's, it's, I don't advise people to buy books as speculative investments in the same way that like people might buy artworks. Something we've touched on a bit, but I'd love to hear your further thoughts, is the Amazon effect. Amazon, of course, significantly transform many industries, most especially books. What has the Amazon effect been on art books, though? And while people may think it has only negatively impacted things, has their presence in the market resulted in some positive elements for you as a seller? Since its inception, like I said, you know, the book trade was viewed as something of a genteel nature, and it hadn't changed all that much from the beginning of the 20th century until Amazon's introduction into the marketplace in the mid to late 90s. I have to hand it to them. You know, I don't even generally like repeating that name.com, but they created a better mousetrap. And I believe very strongly in the marketplace as an arbiter for things. And they're successful for a reason. Now, if someone had given, sorry, if someone had given me tens, if not scores of billions of dollars in venture capital to create a successful business over a period of more than a decade, you know, would my business be different? Yes, it would be. But, uh, you know, they managed to pull off a pretty big gamble and it didn't always look like they were going to succeed even after all of the money that had been poured into Amazon. But, you know, their business model was really prescient and they provided a mechanism for, you know, the consumer to be at home watching TV. You know, maybe they're watching the Andy Warhol Diaries um, documentary on Netflix and just say, I should have a copy of that book. They pick up their phone or their pad and basically in a minute, they ordered a copy and it's on its way to their home. That's a hard thing to compete with. And that's, you know, to have recognized that is ultimately what they would be able to provide going back again to, I think their first year was 1984, something like that, sorry, 1994. Um, you know, that's, that's a pretty amazing thing to have turned up with in this period of time. And the other thing that I do have an issue with is the fact that while they created this mechanism for making money off of third-party salaries, offering used and out-of-print books, they used the labor of all these people for over a decade to basically create their whole database. So it's like they they were brilliant, you know, in the sort of evil uh, genius way of a Bond villain of creating this thing that booksellers needed and then consumers felt they needed. And it was made off of the backs of kind of free labor from a bunch of, you know, tens of thousands of booksellers and also kind of using their ultimate might to leverage publishing to come around to their kind of draconian terms of doing business with Amazon because all of those publishers needed them. And it's, you know, it put any number of booksellers out of business But from the standpoint of consumer, it's like Amazon, what a great thing. You know, it's like I can get what I want when I need it and delivery is quick now. And I don't really care always if they put my, you know, Roy Lichtenstein book in a jiffy bag and send it to me and it winds up getting here all banged up. They get people are used to wanting to be catered to immediately. And so there's a big component of that. Maybe that sounds a little too glib and a little too... I don't know, like not nuanced, but things will never go back to being the same. And there are other marketplaces for books in my fields, such as abebooks.com and biblio.com that provide these books in a kind of more 
user friendly, certainly for the booksellers environment. But, you know, they created something that hadn't been there before. And uh, most people just take it for granted. But it's definitely a mixed blessing, if a blessing at all, to most booksellers. We no longer sell on that venue. At a certain point, we felt it was disingenuous to continue doing it. And it wasn't that beneficial to us. And it just drive, drove us crazy with a lot of the hoops that they made us jump through. I do think the first edition book market is a little bit opaque. Just like the art market, it's difficult to know how to get started if you want to begin a collection. So since we have you here, I was wondering if you could share some guidance to new collectors or aspiring collectors and maybe highlight some books they should consider that could be staples of a new collection. I was born in 1956 and I really came of age in my awareness of the art world during the 60s and primary movement then was pop. So for me, pop and conceptual art, which came along in the late, you know, early 60s to late 60s and early 70s for a conceptual material, that's like a touchstone for me. It also, again, I know I've mentioned Ed Ruscha a couple times already in our discussion, but his series of artist books that he began in 1963 with 26 gasoline stations and continued through the very early 70s with 12 self-published books uh, that are super, super important, not only just in the history of art books, but in the history of art, influenced so much in the way of thinking about things, even though Ed Ruscha's paintings are forever associated with the rise of American pop, and certainly on the West Coast, his books really were like the models for the conceptual, photographically based artist book. So I think personally, that material from that period is really interesting. I think Ed Ruscha's books are spectacular. Not all of them have to be thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, which some of them do sell for. You know, there are books that you can find in the hundreds of dollars, especially, you know, 26 Gasoline Stations, his first book, which is super important, as I mentioned. In the third printing, it doesn't have to be a thousand dollar book. Um, you know, people who came along in that generation, books by Bruce Nauman or Al Rupersberg or Seth Siegelob, who was, uh, it's hard to explain what he was, but he started as a gallerist, but he produced exhibitions, not in a selling sense, and exhibitions that were printed in the form of a book or a document, super important to the world of conceptual art. He did about half a dozen books that he was essentially the editor, curator for. Those books are really great. A lot of the early pop art um, publications, Andy Warhol's first exhibition catalog from the ICA in Philadelphia from, uh, I'll probably get this wrong, I think it was 1965, which is a very small book with Campbell's soup cans on the cover. It's just a really super charming document his 1969 catalog from the Modern and Ozate, those are really fantastic things. Um, that's kind of the period that really resonates with me. But, you know, MoMA, I have to say, throughout its entire history, has produced really great documents. There are people who look to collect their catalogs because not only are they informational, and many of them at the time that they were published, especially going back to their inception, there were not other books or catalogs on those artists when the MoMA publication came out. Those are always fantastic things. They continue to have a great publishing program, as does the Whitney and the Guggenheim. So, I, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, for that matter. So, those are some of the institutions that I always look towards. MoCA and the County Museum of Art here in Los Angeles all do great things. And I have to give credit where credit is due. You know, when I was talking earlier about how you know, the galleries were really voracious about making sure that they had great libraries. Larry Gagosian, at a time before he, you know, became the Larry Gagosian we know now, was always adamant about publishing when he had shows. And some of his early publications were really, really great. He did a few catalogs um, in the 80s in conjunction with Leo Castelli. They had a space together. Um, those are great. And to this day, Gagosian probably has the most fantastic kind of back catalog 
of books and catalogs, really extraordinary things like an important book on Ferris Gallery, some of the most important publications on Picasso. They've been really great, great, great about making sure that they had primary documentation for their shows. So those are always great places to start. Some of those books are still available from the gallery. Many of them are not so expensive in the grand scheme of things. And along the same lines, you know, Blum and Poe and David Kordansky here in Los Angeles have been great publishers, along with Zwerner Gallery and Hauser and Worth. So those are books that are actually out in the marketplace now that you can find that if they're in print, they're in print. And if they're out of print, most of them are not so expensive. I, I always think of those as being good places to start. That was great. That was really helpful. Thanks so much. And so I wanted to ask you also about the fact that Arcana was actually in the news recently with the Getty Research Institute having acquired an archive of materials on African-American art and artists that I think you assembled over several decades. Tell us more about that collection and how all of this came about. When I moved my shop um, from, I, we used to, for many, many years, we were on the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica. And when I first moved there, I was in a little space for about two and a half years, and we moved to a larger space in 1989. And when I moved to that slightly larger space, um, a gentleman came in one day, and he was looking at something that I just purchased, which was a portfolio of reproductions of Charles White drawings and paintings that had been issued by a local pharmaceutical company. And he walked in and he saw this and his eyes lit up and he said, man, where'd you get this? It's like, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I collect African-American art. And he, you know, he was African-American and said, I collect African-American art. I try to find all the books that I can. And he said, there's like virtually nothing. He said, this is like one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen. And it just so happened. I mean, I knew who Charles White was and I'd been at, a, at an out of print book dealer who for some reason wound up with six of those the day that I happened to walk into the shop and I bought all of them just because it seemed like such a cool thing. It was this oversized portfolio. It was probably like 16 by 22, something like that with these beautiful prints. And I believe that the purpose of them was essentially to provide art for the waiting rooms of African-American physicians that they could just slap in a frame and put up on the wall. So um, he just said like, if you get any more stuff, let me know because I'm always looking for these things. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's really true is, you know, I, I thought about it. It's like, well, you know, there are certain like dozen, 15 books on African-American art and artists that I'd handled multiple times. And, you know, they were mostly um, traditional artists that we think of as like, you know, Romare Bearden or Jacob Lawrence or Aaron Douglas, like an older kind of generation. Um, and I just thought, huh, I'm going to think about this and see what I find in my travels. And I realized that as I ran around town and, you know, Southern California looking for out of print material, there wasn't that much. And that really traditionally there hadn't been that much published. It was really a scholarly underserved portion of art history. And so I thought, well, I'm going to stick one of these Charles White portfolios aside. And every time that I get a book about an African-American art, sorry, an African-American artist, or African-American art specifically, or, you know, the African diaspora in the Western hemisphere and the, the representation or the art from that, I'm just going to put it aside and see where that leads me. And so first I had a shelf and then I had a bookcase that was in a loft at the back of our store where I just kept these things. Every time I got a single book in, I didn't sell it the first time I got it. I just put it in this collection and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so 30 some odd years later, it became time to find a home for it. it had, I'd amassed close to 4,000 books and documents and pieces of ephemera. And it just needed to find an institutional home where it would be available for scholarly research. And I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I've lived here all of my life. And it was important to me that it try to remain in town. I mean, there are resources elsewhere in the United States, you know, most notably the Schomburg Library in New York, which has one of the most extraordinary collections of material, not just art, but related to the African-American experience 
there are some institutions, you know, there's the Museum of African American Art in Washington that it opened. There are traditional black colleges, Howard University that have really, you know, Emory University that have really great libraries, but there wasn't anything like this on the West Coast. So I'm very, very happy that we were able to structure a deal whereby the Getty Research Institute acquired this. It will have a proper institutional home. It won't take up 19 bookcases, which is what it ultimately took up at Arcana, and um, people will have access to it. Lee, thanks so much again for coming onto the podcast and sharing your unique perspective on art books. We really appreciate it. And before we let you go, do you have anything to plug at the shop? Um, well, thank you for the opportunity. No, I mean, I really most of all appreciate the opportunity to, you know, talk with you, disseminate a little bit of knowledge. I mean, after all, what I do is completely wrapped up with the dissemination of knowledge about a very, you know, kind of specific group of things. So it's nice to be able to have this opportunity. I would say one of the things about the pandemic, which we haven't really mentioned, is the fact that our shop used to have quite a number of book signings and discussions throughout the year with artists, photographers, architects, designers, authors, when their books would come out. And we pretty much curtailed that. We're only just kind of now starting to dip our toe back in the water. So we, you know, I would like to say, oh, we have all these things coming up. We do have a couple, but rather than be specific about it, if people wanted to know what we're up to, uh, if it's not too shameless a plug, I would suggest that they go to our website, which is arcanabooks.com, or especially check out our Instagram page, which is just arcanabooks, where three to five times a week, we put up a book of the day from the new things that arrive that we think are interesting. And so they can kind of see what's coming out and, you know, just get a feel for the things that we're looking forward to seeing are coming into the shop when we have events or we get signed copies from authors or publishers, which we do quite frequently, um, which is kind of one of the nice things about collecting, you know, is finding books that have been touched by the hand of the artist or the photographer. So we get a lot of that stuff. And, you know, maybe we only get 10 copies and maybe it's gone in a week or maybe it's gone in six months. So if people check us out, you know, you can get on our emailing list, find out about those things or look at our Instagram page and be aware of that. And I also want to give a shout out to my wife, Whitney, who you mentioned at the beginning, because really this is, we're almost at our 40th year and I have no idea what we're going to do to celebrate that. But I know that just like personally, the thing that enables me to deal with all the kind of curatorial aspects and book aspects of the store, which is the one thing that I really do love besides interacting with the people we like to interact with is, you know, the fact that my wife and partner takes care of the back end of the business so that I can focus on the books themselves. And so thanks, Whitney. And thanks, Adam. Absolutely. Thanks so much again, Lee. Thank you, Adam.